Living crocodilians are all semi-aquatic predators represented only by 30 species. They are all adapted to hunt animals in or near the water, with some adapted more for fish and others more for land animals that come to take a drink, while others still are more adapted to crack and crush through the tough armor of shelled or heavily built animals. This moderate diversity in modern crocodilians is restricted mostly to the teeth and the skull. But in the past, crocodilians and members of the much broader group, Crocodilomorpha, adapted to a much wider range of ecologies rivaling those now taken by mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and sometimes even birds. They are the best example of the inherent contradiction to the term living fossil. The gharials are some of the most unique of the modern crocs. Though gators are adapted to attack and crack apart hard prey, both gators and crocs are capable of taking on similar prey items. Gharials, on the other hand, are exclusively adapted for catching and rendering fish. They have long, skinny snouts lined by long, skinny teeth that snag onto slippery prey items. There is only one species of gharial, Gavialis gangeticus, and where it places in its tree of life has been the subject of much discourse over the years due to different analyses if anatomy or morphology is considered or if molecular analysis is considered. Sometimes the gharial places right next to the false gharial or the tamistoma. Other times, the gharial shows up as a completely separate outgroup to all other crocodilians. This has led to a mystery as to how the modern gharial evolved. Where did its group split from the greater crocodilia? Thanks to the confounding conclusions reached when molecular data is considered or when morphological data is considered, the answer to the evolutionary mysteries of the long-snouted gharials lies in more fossil relatives. As luck would have it, a brand new extinct gharial relative was named based on bones from Bronze Age Southern China, and it shows an awesome transitional suite of characteristics between gharials and tomistoma crocs. Between 1963 and 1980, a total of six specimens, everything from skulls to skeletons to osteoderms, of a gharial-like crocodilian were uncovered from a dig site in Dalincon, Guangdong Province, southern China. Once collected, they were misidentified as the ancient remains of modern gharials and were thus forgotten about for decades. An international team of American, Japanese, and Chinese scientists, Masaya Aijima, Yu Chao, Wenbin Lin, Yu Zhepeng, Minoru Yonada, and Jun Liu, redescribed these remains as a new genus of gharial relative. They named the croc Anyusukus sinensis, with Anyu in honor of Tang Dynasty Chinese government official and poet An Yu, and the species name being Latin for of China. Anusuchus was somewhat of a transitional form between the Tomistoma crocs and the true gharials. Anusuchus bears a superficial resemblance to the Tomistoma rather than the gharial. Gharials have a wide, short, blocky head with their super thin snout attached to the front almost like a separate chunk. Tomistomas, on the other hand, have a more obvious transition between their skull and their jaws. Despite the resemblance, Anyusukus shares a lot of characteristics in its bones with the true gharials. A bizarre part of the anatomy of Anyusukus is the intricate sinuses within the skull. Modern gharials are noisy brats. They love to hiss, gargle, and buzz. Some consider them the most vocal of the crocodilians, and the same must have been for the Anyusukus because it had a huge resonating chamber within its skull. The auditory chamber, or bulla, is composed of front and back chambers. Only the back part of the chamber is preserved in the Anyusukus remains, but it's possible they had the front chamber too. Anusukus was a huge croc. Most of the material collected of the beast is of adult individuals since all the bones are heavily fused. Their sizes range from 2.83 to 6.19 meters, 9.28 to 20 feet, 
making them as large as the largest individuals of the largest species of living crocs, including gharials, on average. This was a huge, snooty beast that probably got bigger than these lengths. Unlike many mammals, crocs continue to grow as they age. They slow down over time, but continue to put on inches until they die. It wouldn't be surprising if there were 25-foot, 7.6-meter giants, especially if archaeological reports are anything to go on. Due to the recentness of the sub-fossil croc remains, the researchers were able to use accelerator mass spectrometry, radiocarbon dating, to get a precise age. Collagen was extracted from the bones and purified using a gelatinization method. Based on the amount of carbon-14 remaining in the bones, the age could be estimated at 3300 to 2900 years before present. This croc almost had the makings of a modern-day cryptid. There are many cryptids that are essentially tales and accounts of surviving members of species that did actually hang on longer than thought. The cryptidicity of Anyusukus falls apart though because there are no modern accounts of these types of crocs in this region. But there are accounts of the crocs from the last few centuries of their existence. Iijima and colleagues collected a bunch of ancient reports of a crocodile that matches the description of Anyusukus. The first report was made by Bu Ji, a governor sent to Xiao Zhou who happened to make note of animals he saw there. Some were known animals like the Chinese alligator, while others didn't match anything known, hence the Anyusukus connection. Literature and reports dating to the Three Kingdoms period, 1730 to 1670 years ago, tell of crocodiles used as moat protection in a castle south of Huazhou City in southeastern China. Though this is somewhat outside the range of the Anyusukus crocs, it's not so far as to be impossible to bring them there. The crocs in the moat are described more like that of the Chinese alligator, but are routinely described as quite large, up to 6 meters in length. They were also said to be fed all sorts of animals, and even human criminals. Other stories from this time period describe repeated encounters between people and crocs, usually of a malevolent nature. The crocs usually always ended up at the wrong end of the stick, with plenty of references to their beheadings and preservation of their heads. 1,131 years ago, politician poet An Yu wrote about the crocs. He demanded that the crocs leave the waters of the Han River Delta and Bad Creek, which were notorious for croc attacks. An Yu apparently did some animal sacrifices and threatened the crocs with poisoned arrows lest they not comply to his demands. Hostility between humans and these crocs would continue for centuries more. The last report that Iijima and team connect to the record of Anyusukus dates to 1630, wherein a ceremony of sacrificial wine and animals was undertaken to appease or be rid of the crocodiles endemic to Ainan Island. These archaeological and historical records suggest the reptiles were lounging across Fujian, Guangdong, Guangxi, and Ainan provinces from the late 4th millennium BC to the mid-2nd millennium AD, or about 4800 to 2500 years BCE, until only a few hundred years ago. To corroborate some details provided by accounts and stories of Anyusukus like crocs, the research team made sure to investigate the curious chop marks strewn across the specimens. Direct evidence of human croc interaction is the over a dozen chop marks on the top of the skull of one specimen, implying intention to kill with wax to the head with a sharp object. Another chop mark made to the occipital condyle, the ball and socket attachment between the head and neck, was probably done to dismember the croc after death. Another specimen had chop marks on the fourth neck vertebra as a clear result of decapitation. The types of deep chops made to the bones of these poor reptiles strongly indicates the use of a heavy metal tool, which helps to continue to corroborate the dating of these specimens provided by the carbon dating. 
They were dated to what is known as the Bronze Age, so bronze axes were a probable instrument for the deaths of the Anyusukas. Though the incidences that caused the deaths of the described individuals of Anyusukas were not the incidences that made them go extinct, they were indicative of a wider agenda to do so that eventually succeeded. Whether or not attacks from Anyusukas on people are substantiated, they were blamed for such events. They took the brunt of it over a period of a thousand to a couple hundred years and were reduced in number enough to be incapable of bouncing back. Anyusukas was another of the many casualties of human-induced extinction. Habitat loss and degradation, plus straight-up extermination campaigns, saw to it that we would never again see these behemoth fish eaters. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.